working. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Claire Olekshak. I am the Executive Director of Sustained Dane. Um, I am really excited for this presentation today. <laughs> About a year or so ago, we did a lunch and learn on native plants. Lots of people were excited, and I feel like this is the second part. It's the plant, and then, wait, wait, but who are the pollinators enjoying those plants? <laughs> so I'm looking forward to learning a lot today and uh, hearing from you, Claudio. Um, before we get started, I do want to thank um, all of our sponsors and our members who make these programs possible. Um, since we last met, we've had three new organizations join us, Playcon, Sir Jenny and Floor Covering, and Shorewood Hills, plus two individual members, so welcome to them. And I also would like to recognize our some of our renewals in May and June, our long-term supporters, those include Dane County Department of Waste and Renewables, Findorf, Artisan Dental, City of Madison, Full Spectrum Solar, KL Engineering, Green Life Trading Company, Invest Microfinance, Morgan Center for Public Service, the Farley Center, and three individual members. So please do consider membership as a way to support Sustained Dane um, and coming to these programs. We have a couple other upcoming um, opportunities to be involved with Sustained Dane. Um, this, on tomorrow, we have a networking event at 5 p.m. at the State Line Distillery. Um, you'll have an opportunity to you know, more informally continue networking and get to know people. We also will have a Dane County All-Around program on August 24th in Deerfield. This is a program that's going out to different municipalities around the, the county and hearing what's happening in these local um, areas. And then the last one is on Wednesday, August 16th, the Obert Beer Garden will be sponsoring us. Um, all proceeds um, will be going to Sustain Dane, and let's hope for beautiful weather like we have today, because it's such a nice place to stay. So that is all I have to share, and now I'll pass it over to Claudio. So welcome. Thank you, guys. Give me a second while I get set up. I'm going to actually do something that I generally don't do, which is set a timer for myself because I want to make sure I give you all uh, an opportunity to ask questions at the end, and I don't want to go too long uh, as well. So first of all, uh, thank you to uh, Claire, Sustain Day, to Sam, to Lorenza for uh, organizing uh, my attendance here uh, today, and I'm really looking forward to telling you a little bit about um, a group of organisms that I've been working on for the last 15 years or so, and uh, what What's going on with them? This is kind of the question that we that I often get. Hey, uh, what's up with the bees? I hear they're in trouble. You know. So, so what I hope to do today is to um, tell you a little bit about the bees, uh, and I hope that um, maybe I'll start here. Like, where are the bees here? I know this is. Uh, I was hoping for like a perfect screen so you can actually see any uh, see things. Like, where are the bees? I'm going to give you a minute to like squint your eyes and see if the uh, Talk to your neighbors, maybe. I hope, I hope you don't pick number three. <laughs> All right, here's the bees. I bet some people got tripped up by this one. Kind of looks like an ant. Those are called velvet ants. They have a really painful sting. Don't touch them. Uh, they're wasps. They're actually not, uh, not uh, but they look like wingless uh, bees. Bees are really diverse. Um, and one of the things that I uh, hope, these are not bees. Uh, these, are, uh, these are wasps. These will become your nemesis uh, later on in the summer at your picnics as you're enjoying a drink at the terrace or your, uh, your brats. These are, uh, these are predatory wasps. They're, they're predatory insects. Uh, they're in the same general group. Uh, but but uh, they're doing something really different, which is they're eating things that have meat on them. Usually they eat caterpillars. They're really great predators in our natural ecosystems. And at that time of the year, in October, September, um, they're trying to pack up for the winter, get enough into their queen so they can, uh, they can uh, produce a lot, of, uh, a lot of babies. And they'll come for whatever is available to them, including your sandwiches and your turkey uh, and whatever else that. So when you're at a picnic next time and someone says, ooh, the bees are at my whatever, and you can look at them and say, actually, those are probably wasps. Those are probably not going to be bees. So if you can remember that one thing from today's uh, presentation, and I have, 
it will be a success. So here's some of the things that I hope uh, we can we can talk about uh, today, and I can tell you a little bit about today. And this is kind of like uh, the objectives. My objectives for today is tell you a little bit about wild bees and why they matter. Um, answer this question of, of are they really in decline? So what's up with the bees? Like are they really in trouble? Like we uh, like we hear about. And what can I do to help? And I want to. I hopefully won't leave enough uh, time at the end to like think really broadly about what this might actually uh, look like. Uh, and along the way, I promise I won't show too much data and too much science, but I do want to give you a little bit of a sense of like, what are researchers and scientists doing to understand these particular groups and, um, and where, what do we really know about them? So I want to rewind the clock a little bit to uh, this period here, 2007, um, when uh, there was kind of a, a call out uh, by professional beekeepers like this gentleman here, David Hackenberg in um, Pennsylvania, uh, who would come to their beehives uh, in the in the spring? They would open them up after the winter, and he started noticing something really bizarre, which was not only did his bees not make it, which is not unusual. You know, winters are harsh, and uh, his, uh, his honeybees, uh, you know, honeybees of beekeepers. I don't know if there's any beekeepers here. It's really hard to get bees through the winter a lot of times. Um, but he actually noticed that the bees were just gone, like they were not even there. It was empty. The hives were empty which prompted all kinds of crazy speculation about, like, what's going on? Is this like an alien abduction? Actually, that was suggested. Uh, was this kind of uh, cell phone tower interference with their navigation? That was suggested. No, it is not cell phone tower interference or 5G or whatever it is. Um, and this phenomenon here, this like disappearance and like mass exodus of bees and the loss of uh, overwintering uh, bees, was termed colony collapse uh, by the popular press, really. So entomologists uh, kind of came in and started to try to document what is really going on here. Um, and there's a wonderful book, uh, Vanishing Bees, by a, a colleague of mine, uh, Sayanath Suryanara Nayanan, uh, who was here at UW, who kind of documented the phenomenon and kind of the sociological um, aspects of this uh, colony collapse uh, effect, if you want to read about it. And so, I want to um, like focus on a couple of things. So here's point number two of, uh, of my presentation. Commercial beekeeping and the colony collapse was really a phenomenon that was described specific to honeybees. Honeybees are like the workhorse of the pollination world. And there's one species of honeybee that we have here in North America. And this is the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. This is what we call it. It's actually the state insect in Wisconsin. <laughs> it's an exotic uh, bee uh, that is managed like, uh, like little livestock. We keep it in confinement, we feed it, we tend to it. They're actually quite docile as far as insects, as far as uh, bees go. You can put them in boxes, you can move them around. Uh, they have these really big colonies uh, like this um, that overwinter, so they're perennial. They can last many years, especially if you can uh, take care of them. And just by their sheer numbers, that you could rear them and get them to, to grow very large, just by their sheer numbers, they're incredibly effective pollinators of our agricultural crops. So we can, we can control them, in a sense. We can move them where we need them. So this is one species of bees. So folks started getting concerned, well, what's going to happen if we we get continued losses of bees that, uh, that look like this. So there was uh, many programs that were started, one uh, including this one here called the Bee Inform Partnership, which actually uh, did surveys of professional beekeepers and said, what's your overwintering losses and what's going on when you open them up? And uh, just so that you see this, this line here, this gray, these gray bars, like right around 50%, this is kind of what your average beekeeper would say, this is a tolerable loss. Bees not all colonies will make it uh, through the winter. This is kind of what people were observing starting in the 2007s. You know, colony losses over wintering of 30 to 40 percent. These are pretty typical for Wisconsin as well. The Department of Ag, uh, Trade and Consumer Protection, DATCAP here in Wisconsin, is the regulatory agency that keeps track of honeybees, kind of like, like an agricultural commodity. And they've been keeping similar kinds of uh, data for Wisconsin. And some years it's really bad, 40 percent. So this is a real economic challenge for professional beekeepers because 
they need to build their populations back up so that they can uh, bring their bees around and uh, do their business, uh, their, their, uh, their enterprise. Uh, so it's a costly affair. But it's not like we're losing, this is not a, an extinction event. This is just like your, your stock of animals has gone down and now you need to build it back up. So it's, it's an economic uh, cost. It's not really a conservation problem. Okay. So um, nevertheless, it kind of pointed to something weird is going on. What is it that is affecting honeybees? And you know, could this be the same with, uh, with other bees uh, that are out there? So, so that's point number two. Colony collapse, our focus on you know, what might happen in a world without bees, really started with our focus on commercial beekeeping and this one species of exotic bee that is pretty well managed uh, right now. You know, the price we'll pay if we don't figure out what is killing the honeybee. At least this author you know, did a good job of saying this is about honeybees, although these are the kinds of titles that we're we're losing bees all around. This is a campaign that uh, Whole Foods did with the Xerxes Society for Vertebrate Conservation. It's a really wonderful uh, advocacy and um, outreach organization out of Portland. And they said, well, what would our grocery store look like you know, if we didn't have insect pollinated foods uh, around? This is, uh, this is what it looks like with bees, and this is what it looks like without losing a lot of things, a lot of the kinds of things that we really like, and that actually are some of the biggest sources of our uh, vitamins and other uh, nutrients that we really need. Pollinator-dependent crops are not where our calories come from, but they're where a lot of the, uh, the extra things that we really need, vitamins uh, and so on, come from. You know, these are the kinds of things uh, that people started trying to document. How much of our agricultural economy is dependent on insect pollination uh, for them. This is, these are some old values here. The $188 billion of our agricultural production uh, comes from um, crops that are insect uh, pollinated. These are the most effective and important pollinators of, of these crops, including most, you know, quarter of our fruits, vegetables, nuts, things like almonds. You see the almonds uh, there? Oh, maybe I didn't put that picture. Oh, there they are. Um, picture of almonds there. Coffee, who's enjoying their coffee today? Who likes chocolate? Yikes. Uh, in Wisconsin, apples is a huge uh, um, commodity. And really, uh, cranberries are probably our biggest specialty crop that we have here in the state. Entirely dependent on, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, a great a fraction of their pollination is dependent on uh, bees. Honeybees are the most important, but we did a lot of work also looking at the contribution. So there's an economic value, there's a utilitarian value of bees uh, that we start getting concerned about, and maybe even a human health uh, connection here that we needed to be uh, thinking about. This is actually what it looks like on a cranberry marsh, uh, maybe about a month ago when cranberries were in bloom. This is a cranberry marsh right here in the background. It's kind of hard to see. And these are the kinds of densities of honeybees that uh, um, growers would bring in. Each one of these here, the stack here is a single hive. There's a single queen right here. So this is a set of four, we call these quads, a set of four of these hives. And they'll bring them out to the tune of two, three, ten hives per acre. Uh, and uh, an individual marsh might have 200 acres or something like that. So that's a lot of bees. Each hive might cost about $100 for rental right now. And those prices were going up uh, because it was harder for the beekeepers to keep them through the winter. A big, uh, uh, yeah, these are important for our agricultural systems here. And there's some places in the world where uh, bees just can't actually survive there, including the, the wild bees, because of the, some of the environmental issues that I'm going to talk about in a second. And that, those pollination services actually are carried out by people. Uh, this is a woman here. She has a, a basket with, uh, with pollen. She'll put that little duster here in the thing and then like brush every single flower so that they can get uh, pollination of those plants. Uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, you can imagine would happen if you didn't have those insect, uh, insects doing their, their business. So, um, so people started thinking, okay, uh, is there a backup plan? <laughs> is there a plan B 
uh, are there other uh, pollinators that could be effective uh, at uh, contributing to the, the crop pollination? And in fact, what was going on before, anyway, before we brought in these, uh, these European uh, bees? Uh, our, our native bees, our, our wild, kind of naturally occurring bees, capable of um, doing the pollination that we actually need. So here's some interesting numbers. Uh, again, one species of exotic bee that we're putting most of our uh, emphasis on. Um, globally, there's over 20,000 different species of uh, wild bees, um, and over 400 just here in Wisconsin. This is almost as many types of birds that you get in all of North America, I think. I think it's like 600 species. We've got 400 species of, of bees that come in all different sizes and shapes and different affinities for different kinds of flowers. So bees are just amazing. Um, I think I could just stare at this picture all day. This is kind of a close-up of a face of a bee. You can see her, uh, her eyes right here. Each one of these is pollen grain. And what you'll see here is this fuzzy face and body. Actually, you can't see that in the this picture here, um, you'll notice that these hairs actually look a little feathery. They're actually, uh, they actually have these barbs that point backwards, and it's kind of like Velcro. Uh, the pollen will just get stuck in their, in their bodies. They are specially built for grabbing and holding on to pollen. This is what their bodies are actually meant to do. So just walking up on a flower means that pollen is going to get stuck to them. Then they have these very idiosyncratic behaviors. They groom themselves, they clean themselves, they pack that pollen into their legs, they have these structures of their legs that allow the, the pollen to actually get, um, get uh, easier to carry. Um, and, um, and they will eat the pollen. This is what they do. So they're herbivores. They're vegetarians. Their closest uh, evolutionary uh, uh, cousins are actually the wasps. They kind of came from a, from a meat-eating uh, group and became vegetarians uh, instead. Most bees, oh, here's just another one that is just amazing. They come in, uh, as I said, all kinds of uh, wonderful colors, and you know, this is a metallic green one. Um, most bees, unlike the honeybees that I talked about, are not social. They don't grow in these communal um, uh, uh, spaces where there's a single reproductive female that does all the work for queen. Uh, there's workers with a division of labor. The workers go out and do things. Some of them stay home and take care of the babies and clean up the hive. This is a very unique, uh, I don't want to say unique, it's a very uh, a special type of bee, a uh, group of bees that are called the social bees. Most bees are not social, they're solitary. Mom goes out and does all the work. She will usually, most bees actually nest underground. She will dig a hole underground right here she will carve out a little chamber like this. And in this chamber, she will bring her pollen. And the pollen is all those trips that she did to collect the, you know, visit the flowers. She grooms it off her body, packs it into a little ball, spits up on it, probably transferring some key microbes and yeasts and other things on it that begin to ferment the pollen ball. And then she will lay an egg on top of the pollen ball right here. And here you can see the larvae that have hatched out Junior gets to eat whatever mom provisioned it. They don't have eyes, they don't have legs. Whatever's on that ball, this is what they get to eat. So this is their protein. This is what grows uh, the babies. Um, they will pupate uh, this intermediate stage underground, um, and then they will emerge again in the spring. Some of them might have a couple of generations uh, in the summer. Most bees have this kind of a life cycle uh, rather than the big communal uh, life cycle. 70% of them are below ground. There's others that do the same kind of thing, but they're actually uh, inhabit cavities or tubes like this. This, these are, this is a, a trap nest that we construct. You can buy uh, bamboo, put it in a little bucket like this, give it enough time, and these will actually go and take up shelter in them, put their little pollen ball, cap the pollen ball with a little bit of mud, and they do that all the way down the stem. So they might have, you can find these stems that might have seven or eight little pollen balls if you split them open. That, that's what you would find. Over here, you can't see this very well. This is a cavity nesting uh, bee, uh, like bumblebees, uh, who will nest underground or I've been getting a lot of pictures lately about, can you help me get rid of my bumblebee nest that's in my, yesterday I got one about somebody's uh, barbecue had, uh, had a uh, 
uh, bumblebee nest in it. Um, and these bumblebees actually are social. They have a queen, they have reproductive, uh, re um, the worker caste, uh, but their colonies tend to be much smaller, uh, two to three hundred individuals perhaps. So those are the two key things that, like you and I, bees need. They need food, pollen, which is their protein source. They also uh, will use nectar, uh, which is like their sugary power drink. This is what they use to fuel their flight from one flower uh, to the next. Uh, they will get that nectar. Um, and they need shelter. They need a place to put their, uh, put their eggs and raise their young, either cavities like this or below ground, as I said. So keep that in mind as we start talking about conservation opportunities. Uh, um, another really important thing about bees and thinking about them as a community of organisms that we rely on is that, as I said earlier, they each do something a little bit different. Some bees are active early in the day. Some bees like flowers that are open like this. Others, like bumblebees, like love to get up and, you know, into the closed flowers of, uh, of things like cranberries and, uh, um, you know, that actually require a special kind of effort to get some of the pollen out. Honeybees are actually really bad at doing that. And they just kind of stumble around and they get a little bit of pollen on them. And the only way you can get a lot of pollination is you just bring out a lot of honeybees. You kind of overwhelm that inefficiency with numbers. Whereas uh, insects, uh, the wild bees can actually be much more efficient per visit at grabbing that pollen. So you don't need as many of them, uh, actually. And having that diversity out there gives you that complementarity or that we call it the insurance of you know maybe you know this year is a little hotter than last year or this spring was you know too wet. There's probably going to be some bees that are still going to be able to forage and fly in those conditions. So having that diversity out there gives you that portfolio effect of you're probably going to get be covered rather than putting everything in like literally one species that you hope will do all the work uh, for you. So thinking about pollinators, this is kind of funny because these bees are not going around going oh, I need to pollinate that plant so that you know, we can have our fruits. You know, they're like, I need to get food. And in the process, you know, some of that pollen kind of spills over and it gets into the female flowers. And that's how, this is what we derive benefit from. So pollination is actually kind of a very um, you know, anthropocentric <laughs> construct uh, in, in some ways. It's a mutualism between the flowers and, the, and these organisms. The flowers are getting some benefit because they get fertilized, and they get food uh, as well. So, okay, so that's wild bees. So are they in similar state as our, our, what we were seeing with the honeybees, those patterns of extraordinary losses over the winter? Is that kind of symptomatic of what's happening to uh, wild bee communities uh, as well? So in order to answer that question, you need, you need some data that actually tells you like what did things used to look like and what do they look like today? How do we actually compare? Like, is there a trend that things are getting worse? Man, that's actually really hard data to come by. Um, this was uh, one of the earliest studies by Nacho Bartomeos. And again, you can't really see the, the, the writing on this, but the point is that he was able to go back uh, to uh, museum records, you know, entomologists and natural historians and Others would kind of collect insects uh, and put them into museums. And you can actually go back to, you know, even our museum here at UW and find these specimens from the 1800s and early 1900s and see who was out there, what kind of species were there, how relatively abundant uh, were they. Uh, we did a similar study uh, here with, uh, with bumblebees. And then by comparing the kinds of things that you saw like in the late 1800s, early 1900s to what we're seeing today, you can start drawing some inferences about like, are things worse today than they were maybe 100 years ago or 50 years ago? These are the kinds of patterns that people started seeing like this. Here's a pattern that we saw, you know, and you look at the number of species of bumblebees that were around in the 1800s, early 1900s. Things were okay, maybe they were declining a little bit, and then something happens after the 1950s here. Like there's this real precipitous decline after about the 1950s. That pattern of like, mid-century, mid-20th century decline in organisms is a really common one that we're seeing, not just for bees, but actually we're seeing it for a lot of other things. There was something in the post-war era that happened in North America and in other developing countries that really seemed to be 
incredibly stressful for, uh, uh, for insects and biodiversity more generally. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. I don't want to get, I don't want to give you the impression that all bees are kind of hopeless here. Things are going, are going really bad. There's actually others, including some exotic bees like this one here in North America that actually are doing great. Whatever we're doing out there in the environment, like they're doing wonderful. The common Eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens, probably the most common bee that you're going to see, bumblebee that you're going to see around on your flowers right here, actually did really well and is probably one of the more common ones uh, right now, including this, uh, as is this, uh, this other one here. But on average, things are not doing very well. And especially the bigger bees, like bumblebees, tend to be the ones that are doing the least well uh, out there. Here's, unfortunately, a kind of the poster child of all of this. Uh, this is the uh, Rusty patched uh, bumblebee, Bombus affinis. Um, it used to have a range based on these museum spe specimens that spanned almost all the way, you know, from the upper Midwest here all the way to the to the East Coast, uh, based on you know these observations. And as of uh, the um, as of 2012, uh, when they published this particular uh, picture, these yellow dots were the only places where people were finding uh, right now. so severe range contra uh, um, contraction here. There's a very, um, there's really a great uh, little video, or I should say a documentary uh, film called um, A Ghost in the Making uh, that was filmed, a lot of it was filmed here in, uh, in Madison here by Clay Bolt. I uh, recommend that if you're interested in this, that particular story. So these are the kinds of things. We're seeing lower numbers, we're seeing fewer species, we're seeing range contractions, particularly with these larger, uh, with these larger species here. This all came to a head, uh, this uh, recognition that Hey, it's not just honeybees, but actually there's probably a lot of other uh, insects, a lot of bees uh, that, are, that are not doing very well. Uh, this um, kind of culminated in a presidential memorandum during the Obama administration, where the, the White House basically said, we want all of the government agencies to come up with their own plans for doing pollinator protection. Look at your lands, look at the practices that you do, and think of ways in which you can improve the fate of uh, honeybees <laughs> uh, and other pollinators. So you can see this duality of like, okay, well, maybe there's a commercial like uh, implication uh, here. In uh, 2017, Bombus affinis actually was the first bumblebee species listed under protection from the Endangered Species Act. Bombus, uh, rusty patch bumblebee, can actually reliably be found here in Madison. If you go to the Arboretum, if you go to Ulbrich, if you go to some of the other parks, and maybe even in your own backyard, Look, it's not very common, but it's reliably found here in Madison. You can find it in some of the suburbs of Chicago. You can find it in Minneapolis. You can find it in Milwaukee. Um, and this led us to think, well, maybe this actually, this species really likes cities. You know? <laughs> and uh, we did some studies on this, and we actually found that, no, this is just actually where people go and look. You know, there's <laughs> a lot of people there. And it's equally, it's relatively, uh, it has the same proportions as if you look at it in rural areas, and people just don't go there uh, as much. But there are some really interesting features about urban areas that I'll say, uh, say in a minute. Um, I also want to put this into this broader context that I think I've touched on a little bit, which is, this is not a phenomenon that's just about uh, bees. This is actually a phenomenon, these declines, is something that we've been seeing with a lot of different groups. Uh, this is a review uh, done just a couple of years ago that looked across the major groups of insects, the beetles, the bees, ants, and wasps, the, uh, the butterflies and moths, the dragonflies, and so on. And of the studies that, that are published looking at their populations, huge numbers of them, you know, 20 to 60% were showing some kind of declines. And some of these declines are actually quite severe, you know, greater than 40% decline over a 40-year period like that, depending on the group. So this is something that uh, was really um, crystallized in some studies that happened in Europe, uh, including this one here by Casper Hallman, who, with a group of amateur naturalists, had been collecting insects in these, what we call, uh, referred to as malaise traps. Insects kind of fly around, they hit this barrier here, they're like, ah, what's going on? They go up, and then they get caught in these cups uh, right here. And they had almost 30 years of data, 27 years of data, of collecting uh, insects in these cups. They did an analysis where they kind of took the contents of these, they like squeezed out all the juice, they dried it out, and they tried to standardize for a bunch of different things. And they found that over this 27 year period, there had been the documentation of about a three quarters uh, decrease in the abundance, in the biomass, in the amount of insects that are found 
in these uh, in these protected areas. So this is even like going into an urban area. These are parks, which are areas that we would think should have lots of insects in them, and they don't. If you, I was in uh, the Netherlands last year, and I asked them. I said, from your perspective, like if you if you think about your environmental challenges, like what what would you say are the things that you all are struggling? And they didn't even hesitate. They said, we have a biodiversity crisis. And I said, well, why is that? It's like, because there's studies like this that are showing us that there's something wrong with the systems. And we need to act. We need to act now. We don't have, we don't have the same kind of reaction you know, uh, here in North America, certainly. Um, maybe I'll just skip over this. There's other data sets here from North America showing very similar kinds of declines. This is for, for a butterfly uh, data set uh, here. OK. So what's going on? So I've shown these trends that are not very promising. Um, the researchers who worked on those, uh, on those studies weren't content with just saying, OK, well, yeah, things are not looking good. Um, they also tried to explain, you know, what is it? What are some of those factors that are actually contributing to these, uh, to these patterns of, of decline? I'm going to summarize it very simply. This is you know, hundreds of, of, uh, of researchers uh, over the last uh, 20 years. But I think with these, we put it into these three bins pretty, uh, pretty reasonably. Um, one is that there are issues with pathogens, uh, diseases that uh, certainly with honeybees uh, are really important. Um, you, the, some of these pathogens are exotic. They've been moved across uh, continents a lot of times into populations that are not uh, resistant uh, to them, um, including this is a honeybee here. You can see this little red dot right here. This is the Varroa mite. It's probably one of the most damaging, economically damaging uh, pathogen or uh, uh, parasites of honeybees here and beekeepers. If you're not on top of varroa mite, you're in trouble. You're probably going to lose your colony. You know, uh, going through the, the winter. Uh, there's a bunch of other viruses and other things that, that are problematic. Um, the the other thing that we've been learning is that some of these uh, pathogens spill over between the managed uh, bees and the wild ones uh, as well. So the more bees you have, especially if they're sick, the more likely it is that you're going to find wild bees that are also sick with the same pathogens uh, as well. Um, the other two categories are things that actually uh, my group has, uh, has spent a lot of time thinking about, and that is habitat loss, a lot of it having to do with urbanization and agriculture. Um, a lot of our landscapes used to look here in this area, probably oak savannas, prairies, uh, things like that. And now, um, if they're not forested, we probably have uh, agriculture uh, uh, there. And the way in which we do agriculture has, always, has also changed a lot. And that's back to that something happened in the 1950s that really changed the trajectory of our, uh, our, of our agricultural landscapes uh, as well. You can't see this very well here, but you can see a tractor with all this dust uh, blowing off like this. Um, and uh, I'll say something about that uh, in a second. So let me say a couple of words about this particular uh, topic. Again, just because I think it's, it's an important one. Um, if you ask kind of the people who work on, on conservation of bees, they would say, what are some of the, the biggest challenges in our anthropogenic uh, landscapes? They would say, well, it's probably having to do with the way in which we do uh, agriculture um, right now. Here's a summary uh, uh, of a study that, that we did, again, looking at those historical uh, populations or historical communities of bumblebees in the upper Midwest. Uh, and we were able to work with uh, a wonderful artist, uh, Liz Kozik, to kind of illustrate the main findings of this particular study. Um, and uh, this was with my uh, former student, uh, Jeremy Hemberger. If you looked at what our landscapes looked like in the early 1900s, um, the average uh, county probably had a, about 12 different types of commodities that they were, uh, that they were growing. They had wheat, they had peas, they potatoes, they had all kinds of things. These were, these were, there was a lot of agriculture in these landscapes, actually. There was, a, there was actually was more land in agriculture in the 1920s than there is today. Okay? About 35, 40% of our landscape you know, here in Wisconsin, for example, is in, is in agriculture. But these were very diversified uh, kind of systems, and we're depicting that here in, uh, in this, uh, this illustration here. And we had, you know, pretty healthy uh, bumblebee populations uh, here. About you know, 15 different species were pretty regularly uh, found. When you get to about the 1940s, um, you're starting to see a consolidation of the types of crops that are actually grown there. 
Um, you have uh, corn, you had still had a lot of wheat, um, but you start seeing the farm is getting a little bit bigger. And again, right at this transition, 1940 to like 1955, is where you start seeing the intensification of the way that we do agriculture, simplifying the, the cropping systems that we have there, fewer types of uh, crops in the rotation, and the use of agrochemicals, fertilizers for what we're now what we now refer to as the green revolution we need to create a lot of food for people um, and uh, and uh, uh, pesticides for uh, uh, weed control and for insect pest uh, control. Those are the two things that, that really picked up. And you start seeing a small decline uh, here in bees uh, at that time. And then if you look at our landscapes kind of like, you know, maybe in the last decade, the last uh, 20 years, we are on average growing about six different uh, species uh, crops in our in in a county. You know, half of what we used to have about 100 years ago uh, is what we're growing. And we found that this had much bigger effect on the ability of bees to be found than did the amount of agriculture itself. So it's not agriculture itself that is necessarily the challenge here. It's how we're doing it. It's how we're doing it in these really intensified, chemically intensive, um, uh, spatially intensive uh, areas here where we're growing pretty much corn, soy, a little bit of alfalfa, our animals are no longer out there on pastures and so on. We've lost, one of the key things that we've uh, discovered is really important to maintaining bees around our grasslands. We've lost grasslands in our landscapes, we've lost pastures, which allow all those flowers you know, to exist. Um, the other thing is that uh, corn and soy are annual crops. So if you're thinking about a uh, bee that's nesting below ground and you're tilling up that soil constantly, Sometimes you go in, if you're growing potatoes, you're going in five, six times a season, you know, to till it, to hill it, to do various things. That is not habitat for ground nesting bees. They just can't, they can't persist in those areas. So a very different way of, of doing agriculture. So the amount and the type of agriculture has changed, particularly in these last, I'd say, 50 years. And uh, I, I can't uh, not talk about about uh, one of the ways in which we do agriculture, and that is the prolific use of insecticides uh, that we have today, including a new class of insecticides, new as of uh, you know, the, the, eight, uh, the 1990s, a new class of insecticides that we refer to as neonicotinoids. Uh, they have properties that are similar to nicotine, which are neurotoxins for most uh, insects. They're actually kind of not all that good for us uh, either. Um, and uh, the farmers will buy their seeds coated in their pink here. Corn seeds are generally not pink, they're generally this color here. Coated in the neonicotinoid, you plant them, and the plant as it grows actually pulls it and has it embedded in their tissues um, like that. But in the process of doing that, the dust often kind of spills out and wafts over the landscape onto other uh, adjacent plants and flowers that, that bees are, uh, are finding. And there's, uh, Dozen, uh, there's dozens of papers that have shown the, not only the direct toxic effects of the neonicotinoids on bees, but they also have what we refer to as sublethal effects. That is, they affect them in a way that doesn't kill them, but makes them a lot less capable of doing their jobs, like collecting food. They lose their sense of orientation. Um, they, um, yeah, they do things that are not, uh, not good for the, for the colony or for the collection of, of pollen. So, um, so populations are probably in declining because of this. So just to summarize some of the challenges here, intensification of agriculture, both in extent and in the, um, in the way that we're doing it. Um, urbanization is also another uh, aspect way in which we lose habitat uh, for bees. Uh, it's, you're not, you don't have prairies anymore, you have concrete, you have parking lots, you have uh, things like that. Um, I didn't really talk about climate change, but there's probably a climate signal with some of the declines of bees that we're also seeing and exotic species that are coming in, particularly with the pathogens, uh, are, also, uh, are also important uh, here. Okay, we're done with the doom and gloom. All right, what can we do here? Well, if you know what the drivers are, kind of on the negative side, well, at least now you have something to work towards. You have something to, uh, to, to target in order to ameliorate the situation for, uh, for bees. So you probably, uh, I mean, some of you, I'm sure, are already kind of thinking about you know, ways in which you can get involved or ways in which you're already uh, trying to you know, make the world a better place uh, for, for pollinators. So 
I guess point number two, or I think I'm at three now uh, for, for the talk. Like, there are lots of ways in which you can contribute to pollinator conservation. Some of it is very direct and very local, things that you can do, maybe even on your own, uh, your own property. Uh, but I also want to leave you with some thoughts about like what can we do as a group, as a society, as a, as a kind of a civil organization uh, here about improving the world for bees as well. Some of it is not exactly in our backyard. That we could be working on. So I talked a little bit about uh, the food and things that bees require. One of the things that we learned in doing that study of kind of urban associations with bees is we looked at urban and rural areas, we looked at bumblebees that we found there, and we actually found that it wasn't so much urbanization or how many buildings were there that affected where uh, bees were most common. In fact, we found that they were equally common in agricultural areas as they were in urban areas, but the primary factor that really influenced their ability to be found was how many flowers did we see there. So if you have agricultural landscapes that have no flowers in them, that's a bad thing. If you have urban landscapes that have no flowers, that's a bad thing. So that's something that is actually very much in our control. You know, we can actually do things locally like this, or maybe even through, uh, through policies, through planning, through things that will, uh, you know, that could use some of our public spaces or you know, places that are just lawns right now that can get more of these, um, more of these resources that, uh, that bees need. Um, we actually developed in uh, uh, collaboration with the Dane County Environmental Council a little uh, kind of self-quiz that you could do uh, to actually see, like, is my property or places that I have control over, are they, is this a good pollinator uh, habitat? Um, it's a very simple, like, questionnaire. It's got some pictures. This is, does your property look like this? Do you have a little bit of, you know, leftover stems, uh, you know, at the end of the summer? Uh, how many flowers do you have there? Um, this is a QR code that will take you to our website, pollinators.wisna.edu, that has uh, pollinator resources, and you'll find the pollinator habitat. So it's a super easy, you know, it takes you, you know, 10 minutes to, you know, click a couple of boxes, and it will give you a score, like, and suggestions. Like, well, you, you, we noticed that, uh, you know, you like to clean up all your leaf debris uh, every summer, uh, at the end of every, every year. You might, you might think about leaving some around, because overwintering... I'm on target. <laughs> uh, uh, because overwintering queens, uh, bumblebee queens, will actually nest or actually kind of huddle up under leaf litter in the winter. Um, and that's where, they, that's where they reside. So maybe that's something they hadn't really thought about in terms of nesting habitat uh, for, for bees. Okay, so this is something that you can do. Just do a kind of a self-assessment of kind of where, uh, where things are. There's all kinds of other ways to contribute to, to bee science pollinator science more, uh, more broadly. Um, I talked about some of those patterns, some of those trends that, that, we, uh, that we see. A lot of that data actually is derived from citizen science observations. That is, people who go out there and either in an organized way or just like in a happenstance way, uh, make observations of pollinators that are out there, butterflies, uh, bees, bumblebees. And there's ways to record that data so that researchers like myself can get in there and say, OK, what's going on? Where do we see them? Where do we not see them? And so on. Those citizen science projects are really amazing. Um, we developed a really simple one that we call Weeby. I could give a whole talk uh, just on this. Um, it's very simply just like a clicker counter, you know, that uh, you have to be able to identify six different categories of, uh, of pollinators on plants. You can download it from the Apple Store, or the, um, the Google Play Store here. And, um, and we've been, we originally developed this uh, working with the uh, with, uh, growers, uh, apple, cranberry, uh, pumpkin growers, uh, to try to see if we can understand what kind of wild bee communities do they have on their property, and what could they do to ameliorate the situation. During COVID, where people were cooped up inside, they, folks asked us, like, could we just use this like in our own backyard, or can we you know, contribute data from you know, my garden or with a school project? And we said, yes, absolutely, get out there and make observations. So we were... Um, we collected data, you know, people submitted data from all over the state and actually even from, uh, you know, from overseas. We, when I teach my agroecology class, uh, we had students in China who were making observations in, uh, you, know, in their, you know, in their own backyards there. And, uh, and then we can get, you know, these kinds of data over the season split up by what kinds of crops or flowers they were observed on. And 
Um, we don't really have any uh, concrete patterns yet, but if we can accumulate enough of these data, we can start looking at things like temperature, or precipitation, or landscape types, and how they can be uh, influencing uh, bees. So um, this is one that I might encourage you to, to check out, uh, but there's a couple of other really great ones. Uh, the Wisconsin DNR has probably one of the nationally recognized uh, citizen science projects just on Bumblebee. Uh, so I can't, I can't say enough good things about their project called Bumblebee Brigade. You might want to check them out uh, here. And my colleague, uh, Brian Spiesman, who used to be here at UW, has developed a, another app that you can actually do um, identifications of bumblebees just from pictures. Uh, so he developed some, um, some machine learning uh, techniques to do some vision, kind of uh, machine learning um, and computer vision uh, identifications of, of bumblebees, which is really Before I go uh, here, that's, which is my wrap up, I think these kinds of things of getting involved do two things. One is you contribute data to uh, you know, our better understanding of where are pollinators, how, what are their populations like, how do we, you know, what, what do we need to be kind of concerned about. The other thing that it does is it forces you to get out there and just spend five minutes and just look at things and look at where bees are, what do bees look like. You'd be surprised at how little they are, how colorful they are. And just those five minutes of just kind of sitting there and making one of these observations, I think is a really important way that you're getting, you can get engaged. You know, I think you'll find a beauty in them the same way. This, this is the reason why I got into insects in the first place. Is I just think they look cool. They, they, do, they do cool things. Um, and I hope that you'll see that same beauty when you're out there looking at things. And these are insects that are in your backyard. There's other things that are happening at this much broader scale. We have agricultural policy, we have uh, trade policy, we have climate change, there's all kinds of things that are affecting our landscapes at these really broad scales. And there's, we design these landscapes like this. There's, uh, there's food policies and there's supply chains that demand cheap food and make it look, you know, that push our landscapes into looking like this. So I, I had a lot of critique about the way our agricultural landscapes look but I don't want this to sound like a critique of farmers. I think farmers are doing the best they can. We talk to farmers and the projects that we have. They are conservationists. They're doing everything that they can to make a living off of their agricultural products. But they're also stuck in a system that doesn't allow for diversification and doesn't allow for uh, you know, pollinator-friendly uh, approaches. So I think this is kind of where, as a, kind of a civil society, we can also bring pressure to our uh, elected officials to think differently about what our agricultural landscapes uh, could look like. Um, here's a landscape in southwestern Wisconsin that still maintains a bit of that diversity that, uh, that we're uh, looking for. So what are wild bees and why do they matter? Hopefully you've uh, gotten a sense of what that is. Yes. Are bees in decline? Sadly, yes, they are uh, in decline, some more than others. Uh, and there's a lot of different things that you can actually do from your own backyard, to getting engaged with citizen science, to actually thinking about like how should we as a society organize around biodiversity conservation more broadly. So, thank you. Great. So we do have time for a couple of questions, maybe ten minutes or so. So we can go ahead and raise your hand if you do. I know we have a couple, so I'll try to get to as many as possible. Yeah. And I'm not in a rush to leave either. So if we need to. Mm -hmm. Have questions afterwards. Uh, hi, Claudio. I'm Representative Lee Snodgrass. Oh, I wanted to you. thank you so much. Yes. Um, I'm here because I did author some legislation on pollinator protection last session in this session. I would love to share it with Sustained Dane um, so that when and if it gets a hearing, um, you can all weigh in on the importance of this legislation. And I just also wanted to let you know that one of those bills is actually to, um, I kind of joke about Big Honey being responsible for the the Wisconsin insect, but we have a, a, a bill that would change it to the official native insect would be the rusty patch ball. Thank you for your efforts. There's a lot of other really good things in the bill. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, Claudio. Would you mind talking a little bit about the relationship between native plants and pollinators beyond just pollen and nectar and be more as a host? Yeah. Microphone is great, so I don't have to repeat the, the question. But 
Um, yeah, so a lot of times when, when you look at those uh, kind of guides of like how do you create a pollinator garden or things like that, there's a lot of emphasis on um, try to focus on native plants. There are a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, um, bees that are here have evolved and have experienced those plants in their, you know, in their history. And so they have a much better way uh, of uh, accessing the plant, of getting to their food. There's also kind of specific uh, chemistries and other nutrients and other compounds that are in there that bees actually need uh, and can utilize. And so the use of native plants is really uh, key. Now, there are some, like bee balm, there's a reason why it's called bee balm. You know, it is super attractive uh, to, to bees. Uh, probably has just the right mixture of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, of sugar, uh, lipids, if you look at the requirements, so here's, I'll do a slight deviation here about the native plants. If you look, if you look at the nutritional requirements of bees, and you compare honeybees to bumblebees, I'll just put bumblebees in a, in a category. Um, honeybees have a very different set of uh, carbohydrate and fat content that they need. Bumblebees are completely different. You know, they need, they need a lot more protein, they need a lot more fat in their diet compared to the carbohydrates. So, Native plants probably have a better mix of those kinds of um, those kinds of key essential nutrients than some of the uh, some of the other plants, some of the uh, domesticated plants. Let's call it that. So that's part one. Part two about uh, native plants is that um, they are. Um, let me make sure I want to uh, have something key, uh, key to say about that. Yeah. A lot of times the, when, when we source our plants, uh, if we don't get native plants and we go to like the nursery or whatever it is, we're also buying plants because they look good to us. Uh, they might smell nice, they might have cool looking flowers. Uh, those aren't necessarily the plants that actually bees actually like. Those domesticated plants often have lost some of those essential uh, odors or other resource or other um, you know, uh, nutrients that, that you can find in so I think that's another reason to think about kind of wild plants that are uh, you know, that are not kind of part of the horticultural uh, industry that would have direct benefits. Did you have another part of that question? Or did I address that? Okay. I'll let you want to talk more about other pollinators and you know native plants be specific plants. I feel like oh it's not yeah. Kind of yeah yeah. So one of the, the neat things, if you look at things like uh, butterflies, butterflies, uh, the caterpillars actually will feed on the plants themselves. So rather than mom bringing pollen back, so I, I focus this on bees and as kind of the quintessential pollinator because they are the best at moving pollen around. Um, but uh, you know, uh, butterflies have a very different life cycle where mom is not eating the pollen. Mom is just slurping up nectar and flying from, from plant to plant. And the, the eating machine there is the caterpillars, and the caterpillars actually feed on the leaves of the plant. And so that relationship is very different than something that you would have with, you know, with Junior just feeding on the pollen balls. And those, uh, most butterflies are very host specific. They only will feed on a couple of different kinds of plants. And so having those key plants around, you know, monarchs will, the caterpillars feed on milkweeds. You know, that is the only thing that they will, that they will actually so th those are the kinds of things that you can think about, at least when it comes to butterflies. Thank you for, yeah. Hi, thanks so much. Um, so I have two questions, actually. One is if you could give us your thoughts on Novo Bay. You knew that was coming. <laughs> and then the other question is, as far as legislation, I appreciate what representative Snodgrass is working on, but nationally, um, with the food bill, if you know if anything, you know, yep. negotiate every five years. Yep. So, food, sorry, the farm bill. So, food focus, if that would be another place where we might be able to make some inroads. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So, two questions there. One was no mome. So, no mome uh, is uh, a bit controversial uh, with um, some folks. Um, and even entomologists sometimes get a little queasy about uh, the, the notion uh, because, like, why should mowing your monoculture of Kentucky bluegrass less <laughs> make that a better pollinator habitat? You know, so that's the 
you know, that's a legitimate thing. It's like if you've still got no flowers in there, then no, mowing or no mowing is not really going to be helpful. So um, on the other hand, you know, there are kind of less managed uh, lawns that actually do have, like my lawn, you know, it's got lots of clover in there, and it's got like it's lots of creepy Charlie, and it's got all kinds of other, you know, things that will grow in there that actually are important food resources for bees and working on. Um, they will visit, they will visit dandelions too. I love dandelions. Uh, that's an exotic plant uh, as well. If you were to force feed dandelion pollen to a bumblebee for uh, a week straight, they probably wouldn't like that all that much. You know? But if it's part of a mix and it's the only thing around, that's probably not such a bad thing. So I think the spirit is right. It's got us thinking about what can we be doing uh, in our own backyards that don't force us into thinking that you know, we need uniformity, that we can tolerate a bit of diversity yeah, in there as a way to support local biodiversity. So that's why I'm a proponent of Novo May as a first step towards thinking about what else can we do. Like if that was it, if that was all you did and you're like, I've done it, my job's done, I've done pollinator conservation, that would be a lost opportunity. Uh, I, think. I, I like that because it's like, okay, you did Novo May, now let's talk about what do you have in the summer? The next things that we can do. So with our Weeby app, we actually partnered with the city of Sun Prairie here, who is interested in the same question: like, does this actually work? You know, does this you actually get more pollinators when you mow or you don't mow your, your yard? So uh, the participants in our project basically mowed half of their yard and they didn't mow the other half. And then we asked them to make observations using the Weeby app as their clicker counter. And we're still going through the data right now to figure out like did you actually see like an increase in, in, in these numbers? So I think the jury is out as to whether that one single action will actually make a difference. But I think if you add that to like, can you include some uh, mowing tolerant plants into your yard that you know, can tolerate a bit of mowing into a higher level perhaps? I think those are the kinds of things that can make that window in May, late April, early May, which is really, there aren't a lot of flowers around at the time. That could be a positive thing. And your other question had to do with Farm Bill and other policies. Yeah, this is really challenging because we have one part of the Farm Bill that is about subsidizing ethanol and you know commodity crops like cotton, like, uh, corn, soy, uh, the other, uh, wheat, I think, and rice. I think those are the key uh, agricultural subsidies going to those. Uh, and man, this is part of the system that pushes very, uh, that, that kind of gets you to a very maybe obvious solution, which is I'm going to grow a lot of it. If I know that I have, you know, backing of the U.S. government that I'm not going to fail because I have price supports, I have you know, subsidized crop insurance, that's a very smart decision to make. You know? So that pushes us to these monocultures of things that don't have any resources for pollinators um, at all. And then we have another part of the farm bill that says, yeah, but we'd really love it if you did actually some things like plant more pollinator plantings and things like that. So there's a part of, um, there's some uh, farm bill programs like the uh, EQIP, which is the um, Environmental Enhancement Program for Agricultural uh, Lands and the Conservation Reserve Program. We used to have uh, the very uh, vigorous funding for the Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative, which is just now starting to I think we can do more things to kind of level up the playing field between the bigger commodity systems that are not very pollinator friendly, and more specialty crops, and other conservation opportunities on the farm that could push things in, in the other direction. I think that only gets you so far, though, uh, because you know you still have this perception um, and reality that you know we can't make food too expensive, uh, and so I, there's going to be. I think we need additional kind of creative thinking about how do we um, how do we make those cropping systems that actually are good for not just biodiversity but for clean water and for uh, you know healthy uh, rural communities. How do we uh, reward those kinds of activities that have these really diverse outcomes for society? And right now, we just don't have a lot of very creative ways to do that. I think there are ways. I can tell you, we can stick around another half an hour. I think the farm bill is where we need to be putting you know, emphasis on. Yeah. I think that may have been our last question. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we are at the 9.30 mark. I have a couple notes to add, and then we'll hear some last words from Claudio. Um, 
We will give a copy of these slides so that you'll have them. His contact information is on there, so I'm sure he'd be happy to share that with you all. If you have any follow-up questions, you can stick around for a little bit after this as well. Then we will be um, also doing a recording of this presentation that we'll be sending out in the follow-up email, um, too. Um, a couple other small notes that we forgot to mention earlier. I want to give a big thank you to HodgePodge, our coffee sponsor for today. Um, hopefully you enjoy their coffee and their shops located in Corona if you ever want some more. And then our summit this fall is happening November 3rd. Um, you can already uh, get tickets for that online at our Eventbrite that can be found on our website. And then we do have a Live Forward Awards um, that goes with that where we're just looking for local sustainability leaders that you may see in the community and we're looking for your help to uh, have some nominations for that. So if you have everybody in your network or um, people that you interact with, please consider nominating them and that can be done on our website. Um, so some last words from Claudio. We just always like to ask kind of a vision question of just what do you think is the vision for bees slash pollinators and maybe an ideal outcome to leave some lasting words for the audience. This is like in 250 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I don't know. I, I hope that groups like I, I I'm very much a glass half full uh, sort of person. I think we are at an inflection point right now. I think uh, we're seeing the dialogue in the, in the media and in groups like this that is showing that there's a huge appetite for change yeah, in a way that I don't think was there 50 years ago. So I'm so hopeful that pollinator conservation will be part of this broader cons uh, conservation conversation you know, around what can agriculture, what can urban areas, how can we connect the two to really support each other? Awesome. Let's give another round of applause. Let's give you some more questions. I don't have anything. Feel free to grab some more.